you're good to go. All right. Um, all right. Well, happy Halloween. And welcome back to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm MC Owens. Uh, you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is the final session, part 13 of our study of the Sri Maladevi Sutra. Um, and so tonight is going to be the big final conclusion. This is the end of chapter 15, the last chapter of the sutra. I was originally hoping that we would go 15 sessions, but I don't ever like to force those things. So we've come up to number 13, which I guess if it's Halloween, the 31st, 13, right? Um, also the 13, right? Very, uh, very yin versus our 12, very yang. And this is a very yin sutra. This has been a very uh, feminine forward sutra in that way. So it's kind of all very appropriate, I think, that we should conclude this with uh, part 13. Um, even though this is really basically like a, a coda, I guess, it's we're really, it's just the very end of the sutra. The discourse is done, the lion's roar has been roared, uh, but there's actually a lot of really interesting ideas in this little last part here. And so we're gonna spend the next bit of time talking about these. Um, I think I'm gonna actually start just by reading the entirety of the rest of the chapter, which don't worry, isn't much. Um, and then we will kind of start breaking it down section by section. Um, yeah, and so if you, if you missed the sutra, please refer to the, the, all the first part of the series. Um, the Buddha has just concluded sort of pr praising Srimala for her discourse. And then the world honored one, the Buddha, emanated a magnificent light illuminating the entire assembly and elevated himself <laughs> into, into midair to the height of seven palm trees. Using his miraculous powers, he walked in the air and returned to the city of Shravasti. Meanwhile, without taking their eyes off the world honored one, even for an instant, Queen Srimala and her entire retinue gazed at him with adoration until he passed out of sight. Then they all danced with joy and exchanged praises of the virtues of the Tathagata, recollecting the Buddha single-mindedly, they returned to Adoya, which is where Srimala is from. When Srimala had returned to the city, she persuaded her husband, Mitra Kirti, to establish the Mahayana as the state religion. She taught the Mahayana to all females of the city over seven years of age. And King Mitra Kirti taught the Mahayana to males over the age of seven. As a result, all the citizens of the country, without exception, learned the Mahayana. When the World Honored One entered the Jetta Grove, he called to Ananda. He also summoned the king of the gods by thinking about him. In response to the Buddha's summoning thought, Chakra, the king of the gods, and his entire retinue instantly appeared before the Buddha. Then the world honored one told Chakra, the king of the gods, Kaushika, as he is called, you should accept and uphold this sutra, explain it and reveal it for the sake of the peace and happiness 
of those who dwell in the heaven of the 33, which is Chakra's realm. He then told, the Buddha then told Ananda, you too should accept and uphold this sutra and explain it in detail to the four kinds of devotees, the monks, the nuns, the laymen, and the laywomen. Chakra, king of the gods, said to the Buddha, world honored one, what should we call this sutra? How should we uphold it? The Buddha told Kaushika, called king of the gods, this sutra has limitless merit. It is beyond the power of all Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, let alone other sentient beings. Kaushika, you should understand that this sutra is very profound, very subtle, and it is a it is a great amassment of merit. You should now, I should now tell you briefly its names. Listen carefully and think well about this. Thereupon Chakra, king of the gods and the venerable Ananda said to the Buddha, yes, world honored one, we shall accept your teaching. The Buddha said, this sutra is called acclamation or praise of the Tathagata's true virtue and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the 10 inconceivable vows and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the one great vow that comprises all vows and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the inconceivable embracing or accepting of the true dharma and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the entry into the one or single vehicle and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the boundless dharma and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the tathagata garbha and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the Buddha's Dharmakaya and should be upheld accordingly. It's also called a discourse on the hidden meaning of the doctrine of emptiness and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the single Dharma or the one truth and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the one ever abiding, immovable, and quiet refuge and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on inversion and reality and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the intrinsically pure mind wrapped in defilements and should be upheld accordingly. It is also called a discourse on the true children of the Tathagata and should be upheld accordingly. And it is also called a discourse on the true lion's roar of Queen Srimala and should be upheld accordingly. Moreover, Kaushika, this sutra's teaching resolves all doubts. It is the definitive, ultimate teaching, the way of the single vehicle. Kaushika, I now entrust you with this Sutra of the Lion's Roar of Queen Srimala. Reveal it and explain it to the beings in the ten directions as long as the Dharma endures. Chakra, the king of the devas, said, Yes, world honored one, we will follow your instructions. Then, hearing what the Buddhist has said, Chakra, king of the gods, the Venerable Ananda and all of the gods, humans, Asuras, Gandharavas, and the others assembled were jubilant. They accepted the sutra with faith and began to practice it with veneration. Setu, that's the sutra, that's the end. And so let's talk. So there's a lot of 
themes in this little thing I just read. This again, it's sort of a coda, just a little ender. Uh, it has a lot of the elements, a lot of the traditional elements that conclude a sutra, especially a Mahayana sutra, the different names of the sutra, which we will talk about, the entrusting of the sutra, usually to Ananda, who does appear here, but this is being entrusted also to Chakra Devanam Indra, king of the gods. Um, yeah, so all of that's pretty standard fare for a, a Mahayana Sutra, but there's a lot of little elements in here that make this distinctly a Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. And so I'm just going to go through the points as they occurred in the reading that I just did. The first thing that I would like to, to discuss is this. When, the, when I first started, it said the world honored one emanated a magnificent light, right? That illuminated the entire assembly. So this is a pretty standard trope, if I may call it that respectfully. It's a pretty standard trope in Mahayana Buddha Sutras that the Buddha emanates light. Perhaps one of the most famous or what most well-known instances of the Buddha emanating a great light comes to us from the Lotus Sutra. In fact, if you're familiar with the Lotus Sutra, you'll remember that the entire Lotus Sutra starts and gets going because the Buddha emanates a great light. And everybody's wondering about this great light. And that's, again, what prompts the telling or the teaching of the Lotus Sutra. But it's not just the Lotus Sutra, of course. It's pretty much most Mahayana Sutras. At one point or another, the Buddha emanates light. Um, and so let me just say a few words ab about that. Um, the, uh, the, the idea of light especially emanating light is a very important part of the Mahayana tradition. Um, in fact, I didn't even remember this until this very second. There is, so silly to go away, but there is, well, I can't find it now on the shelf, but there's a great book called Buddhist Cosmology, A Philosophy of Light, I believe it's called. And it's an entire book dedicated to the theme of light in uh, Buddhism. It's kind of that significant that somebody took the time to write an entire book about it. Um, so there's a lot of different, you know, understandings and interpretations of what this means. My general way of explaining the light or talking about the light, which some of you have heard, it's a pretty standard spiel for me. But if you haven't heard it, um, the basic idea is this, an analogy that I like to use that I think is, it fa it's found in a few sutras. The analogy that I like to use is this one. Imagine that you're in a pitch black room, totally dark, and you don't know what's in the room. You don't know how big the room is. You don't know what's in the room. You don't know if there's other people in the room, it's pitch black, right? Then somebody comes along and turns on a lamp, turns on a light. And by virtue of that light, you can now see what's in the room. You can see who else is in the room, you can see how big the room is. Now, in terms of, I guess, physics, right? We would understand that the light is sort of creating this luminosity that's allowing one to see. And I think that's actually where this light that the Buddha emanates, I think this is where we might get a little confused because we're thinking of it as photonic light. But let me kind of put it to you this way. When I'm in that dark room and I don't know what's going on, you could kind of relate that to being ignorant, deluded, being in the dark. I think that's even kind of a, a, a euphemism in English, at least. The idea of like, if you don't know, really know what's going on, you're, you're in the dark, right? 
So the idea is, is that yes, it's by virtue of the lamp, the light of the lamp, it's by virtue of that that I'm now able to see what's in the room and I now know what's in the room. Likewise, a way that you can think about this is like this. Prior, maybe prior to reading a sutra like this, or prior to encountering the Dharma, prior to encountering the teachings of the Buddha, you could imagine and say that we don't really know what's going on here. We're confused, we're lost, we're in the dark about why we're suffering, what's causing our suffering. We're in the dark about all of that. And along comes the Buddha and teaches us the Four Noble Truths explains to us what is the source of this suffering it's craving it's wanting it's desiring and ending that craving wanting or desiring puts an end extinguishes that very suffering and the, there's a way in which if you can understand that it makes things clear and sort of brings us out of the darkness of ignorance. And it's like, oh, I used to be in the dark about this, but now I know what's going on. Oh, now I get it. And the idea there is, is that there's a similar transition of going from being confused, being in the dark to understanding. There's a similar transition from when I was in a dark room and needed a lamp versus being kind of existentially in the dark and this dharma being like a great light that illuminates things. And again, it's not photonic light. It's not necessarily luminous light in that way. It is understanding and knowledge. And if you think about that the right way, when I'm in the dark room and somebody turns on the lamp, Yes, there's now the light, but it's about the knowing. It's about the being able to see and see clearly because of the light. So I hope you can kind of groove with that analogy and that idea, right? And that kind of all of a sudden makes sutras very interesting in that sense and makes all of these metaphors of the Buddha emanating a great light. It's sort of like, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. And so that is how I understand the Buddha emanating a great light. And at that point, whether you're thinking about Siddhartha, Gautama, Gautama, 2,500 years ago, presenting the world with these teachings, and that was a great light that was brought into the world. And if you kind of, you know, think of this as a very original message to the Buddha, then there, that was the emanating of a great light in the world. Or you can be a little more Mahayana about it and not be so trapped in time, by which I mean constantly referring back to 2,500 years ago. You could actually see a sutra like Srimala Devi here, that a sutra like this, if you read it and really understand what it's saying, it could be like a great light. And so it may be that the, the great light illuminated by the Buddha is referring to the very sutra that we just finished reading in that way. So that's just a quick little few cents on the concept of light and the Buddha emanating light. I think there's a lot to be considered about that. By the way, too, if you look up in a nice um, uh, Buddhist dictionary or a Buddhist encyclopedia, there tend to actually be in the world of Buddhism three kinds of light. They actually distinguish three types of light, terrestrial like lamp light, like I described in my initial uh, example, a kind of golden light that is given off by heavenly beings. And then the third type of light is the light, light I just described, the light of knowledge.
So interesting if you're kind of into that, um, those metaphors, I would definitely uh, encourage you to look for that book, uh, Buddhist Cosmology. i actually now I'm remembering it's called, interestingly, A Theology of Light. Why they call it a theology, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's an older book, though, so that makes sense. All right. Questions, ideas, comments about light. <laughs> okay. Next up was a a very um, the, a trope. Uh, again, respectfully, I call it a trope that we have seen a few times in different uh, Mahayana sutras that I've explored on the Dharma doors here, and that is the someone elevating up the height of seven palm trees or tala, tala trees, I think is what they're called, but they're a type of palm. So that idea of somebody elevating, I believe Bhadra, the magician elevated up to the height of seven palm trees uh, when he kind of saw the light actually. Um, uh, there was one about a young uh, girl who taught the Dharma and she elevated to the height of seven palm trees. I forget her name off the top of my head. So this is a, this is a theme. Again, it's sort of a trope. You see it again and again. What's interesting about it here, though, is that every other time I've ever seen this, it's been somebody else like Bajra the magician or like the, the young girl who at a certain point to demonstrate a kind of spiritual maturation elevates to the height of seven palm trees. I think it's very significant then that the Buddha elevated to that high after hearing Srimala's discourse. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but nonetheless, this is an interesting uh, again, a trope of this idea of levitating to the height of seven palm trees. And then it gets even wilder, right? The Buddha then walks in the air and travels back to Shravasti. Meanwhile, it says, without taking their eyes off the world honored one, even for an instant, Queen Srimala and her retinue gazed at the Buddha with adoration until he passed out of sight. Then they all danced with joy, exchanged praises, and then returned to Ayodhya. I didn't actually go back to the beginning of the sutra, but I don't remember ever leaving Ayodhya, frankly. The, that was where this whole thing was happening, I thought. So interesting little thing at the end there that the Buddha goes back to Shravasti, Srimala goes back to Ayodhya. Huh, okay. And then we are given the one other little clue, so to speak, in this paragraph, which is it says that Srimala and her retinue, recollecting the Buddha single mindedly. So, in many ways, that's what this sutra has been entirely about. And what I mean by that is, is that a, a technical Sanskrit term for recollecting the Buddha single-mindedly, a technical Sanskrit term for that is Buddha Nashmurti. So you probably know the word Shmurti, but you might be more familiar with it as Sati, which is the Pali. And that's our classic Buddhist word for mindfulness. So sati, shmurti, being mindful or mindfully aware. And, you know, sati or shmurti, that's, that's the name of the game in Buddhism. That's like really the practice. In fact, if, if you're not familiar, I would refer you to a, a very old Pali Sutta, probably the most important Pali Sutta, maybe even one of the most important sutras, and that's the Sati Patana, the foundations of mindfulness, the foundations of Sati. Traditionally, in that sutra and in the early Buddhist tradition, the four Patana, the four foundations of mindfulness are the body, 
So initiating your meditation with a awareness of the body, usually by noticing the breathing, the inhalation and the exhalation, but it's about a kind of a general bodily awareness, being embodied. Um, many modern meditation teachers do this as a body scan, sort of starting either with the top of the head and moving downward. But the idea of the first foundation of mindfulness is the body. The second foundation of mindfulness is Vedana, sensations. Um, of course, in the world of Buddhism, we're not just talking about sensory uh, sensations, but reactions to sensations. So we tend to either enjoy sensations, not enjoy sensations, or not even notice sensations like blinking. That's like a neutral sensation. Vedana are about those reactions. And so the second foundation is to become aware of reactions to bodily sensations. The third foundation of mindfulness is called chitta, mind. Mind states actually is a better way to, to think of that. So states of mind. So noticing if you're in an angry state of mind, noticing if you're in a loving state of mind, noticing if you're in a depressed state of mind, noticing if you're in a elated state of mind. Noticing, of course, too, not judging, but just noticing. That's the third foundation, chitta. And then the fourth foundation are dharmas. You could think of that as teachings of the Buddha, principles or truths that the Buddha taught, the dharma, dharmas. Or you can also think of that as dharma simply as thoughts, uh, mental concepts, right? Um, I'm a terrible person <laughs> is a mental concept. Might be originating from a negative mind state, a negative chitta. And that negative chitta might be arising from some pain or displeasure in the body. And that's the first foundation is the body. So traditionally, in terms of doing the four foundations of mindfulness, we're interested in noticing how our state of mind and maybe the things that we're thinking about are generated ultimately from reactions that we're having to bodily sensations, all right? That's kind of a quick, very quick, standard kind of way of thinking about the four foundations of sati or mindfulness. What I always like to tell uh, my students or whoever's listening is that the word smrti, which is the Sanskrit pronunciation of sati, the word smrti or sati, it actually means to remember. The, actually, in what I just read, they called it recollecting, to recall, to bring to mind, to remember. And what I think is interesting about that uh, meaning, the etymology of the word sati or smrti, that it actually means to remember. What I think is interesting about that is that if you are advised by a meditation teacher to say, um, to practice focused mindfulness, sati, on like a candle flame, I think it's interesting to know that that word means to remember or recall. And so in doing a focused awareness practice, it's kind of like a remembrance. And that's kind of weird to think about remembering what it is you are presently looking at, right? That's kind of weird. In a, in a way. So I think, and I think that that's actually interesting in thinking about the practice of mindfulness. And I don't, you know, I don't actually don't want to trip anybody out in, in that way. But what I mean is, is that even right now you could do it. Uh, try to think of like, I don't know what you ate yesterday. Try to remember that. And there's a way, if you notice the way your mind works, when you go to do that, 
there's a way that you kind of for a moment stop thinking about a lot of other things because you're trying to recall exclusively what you ate yesterday. So there's a kind of a way of um, almost like an economy of, of mind <laughs> that like we only have so much attention and we can kind of be really scattered about it. But when we just try to remember something, there's, it's almost like instant focus because there's kind of no other way to do that. There's no kind of no other way to remember what you ate yesterday without really stopping and thinking about it. And then you're like, oh yeah, I had that. But right before that, you, you're really kind of focused and engaging your mind in a way. And that's what I think is interesting to, to sort of consider when performing or doing this act of mindfulness, that it's engaging that same type of remembrance but in the present, not in the, not focused on the past. So that's interesting, just that. But this text says recollecting, recalling or sati, satiing, schmertering, right? But the idea of remembering single-mindedly the Buddha. So this, what I called a second ago, or a minute ago, a few minutes ago, what I called Buddha Nishmurti, Shmurti or Sati on the Buddha. So the idea is not necessarily the body, not necessarily sensations, not necessarily chitta, not necessarily dharmas, but mindfulness of the Buddha. And this is indeed a Mahayana Buddhist, Buddhist practice which is not to meditate on a candle flame, not to meditate on a mandala necessarily, but to meditate on an image of the Buddha, a statue, uh, a painting, or you can even read different sutras that describe the 32 auspicious or unique characteristics of the Buddha. Um, these various features like having 40 teeth, having a protrudence in the, in the forehead, having a white tuft of hair between the eyebrows, having webbed fingers and toes. All of these different characteristics, you could actually read about them and then imagine those qualities and that is a way of doing sati or shmurti within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. But what's interesting about this though, is that you would begin that meditation by meditating on the body of the Buddha. Then you might move on to, how does that make you feel? Then you might move on to the mind state you are in while gazing upon or thinking about the Buddha. And then finally, we would arrive at that fourth foundation of mindfulness, which is the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. So what I want to, basically what I'm getting at is the Mahayana Buddhist practice of like meditating on a statue of the Buddha or just the idea of the Buddha. It's not that far away from that original four foundation formula. In fact, if we were to take a sutra like this, a super Mahayana sutra like this, the way that you could think about this is that to meditate on the body of the Buddha, to meditate on the sensations of the Buddha, to meditate on the mind of the Buddha and to meditate on the Dharma of the Buddha. Maybe that's meditating on our true body and not this body of delusional lakshana, as they might be called, of delusional characteristics. Just a thought, just a thought. Either that or, you know, it's about statues and staring at statues. I don't know. I have often heard 
many a, a many an enlightened practitioner that I have encountered, uh, monastic and non-monastic, when asked about pr praying to a Buddha statue, I have heard often, that's not, or I should say it this way, I have often heard people say, oh, no, 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 that's an image of my own most enlightened self. And so I'm just praying to my own most enlightened self. <laughs> that is my body. <laughs> but I don't quite fully realize it yet. So it appears to be outside of me. And perhaps, maybe, through the meditation of recollecting the Buddha single-mindedly, there can be a kind of collapsing of that. And then again, coming into that, well, what the sutra that we've read calls the Dharmakaya. That's a few words about that. Right. Questions, anything come up in that first paragraph? That's the, actually the first paragraph I read, by the way. Just cruising along. Cool. Brendan, um, perfect. Oh, I just, um, I, I, I didn't totally follow the, uh, like, the, the in remembering, uh like there you you're bringing a focus like it, it requires a focus and i guess could you just maybe quick you know not to belabor it but i'm just trying because there was something there and i couldn't quite follow what you what point you were trying to make um i guess uh, uh, to reword it i was trying to point out that the the act of remembering something like real, real basic stuff, which is why I use the idea of like what I ate yesterday. I don't know. I don't know about you, Brennan. And, you know, I really try not to presume anybody's state of enlightenment. <laughs> so I always just use myself because that's all I really know. But for me, if you were to ask me, hey, Michael, what'd you have for lunch yesterday? I wouldn't be able to instantly go miso soup. <laughs> like instantly. I would actually have to stop and think about it. And in that moment, and this is why I kind of asked you all to do it, to try to think about it, because in that moment when you're doing that, you, there's a way that you kind of, at least for a microsecond, if not longer, are not thinking about the future, your worries, your anxieties, but for that brief moment, you're focusing on Oh yeah, I had miso soup. <laughs> and so that's a brief moment of sati, a brief moment in which we are fully engaged with the mind and actually like engaging it in that way. And so imagine a prolonged period of remembrance. That's a way of thinking about mindfulness or sati or smrti. But Michael, I have a question to that. Yeah, Connie. Well, Brandon, do you have a follow-up question, or are you I mean, uh, not really. Just that, like, yeah, in thinking of what I had yesterday, I was yesterday. It was I was in yesterday. It brought me. It had to. It brought me fully out of this moment and and into that moment. And and just yeah, like you said, like I had no option to remember what I had yesterday was to like not be here for those moments so uh, yeah i think yeah that's that's great i'm glad you elaborate go for it connie i'm glad you asked the question brendan um, yeah connie go ahead question that i mean when i think about yesterday and we don't need to get totally in details but when i think about yesterday what actually my brain does i assume i go to the or my brain the part of the brain lights up that is uh responsible for memories i guess so so my you know i my brain gets but I wouldn't necessarily call it uh, um, so, not satori, but like a mindfulness, because it's for me it's just a different layer of consciousness and how my mind operates. It's not a on it's not an expression of increased amount of awareness because you know when I think about yesterday I can read and that's what happens to us all the time, especially thinking about the past and future. As we all know, we get lost in thought. So for me, there's less. There's maybe a single pointedness, a, a millisecond of 
awareness because the mind is focused, right? Because the mind uh, looks for a memory, but then gets lost. Because once you say miso soup, then like, oh, the miso soup was good or bad. My wife should have cooked it better. Oh, I liked it. So yeah, anyway, so. Yeah, yeah I hear what you're saying, Connie. And I actually think what you said is interesting regarding, so, you know, these ideas of like awareness or, or focus, and then eventually leading to even states of dhyana, satori, samadhi, all of these things, you know, sati or mindfulness, even, even not, not in the crazy Michael way that I just told you about, but just regular old sati, regular old mindfulness of breathing, ana, anapana sati, just regular old mindfulness of breathing. It is about sustained focus on the breathing that brings about heightened awareness, that brings about dhyana, that brings about samadhi. So the mind, the sati itself is the, the starting point. And the idea is, is that normally our minds are very, you know, like the proverbial drunk monkey, just jumping from, oh, what was that? Wait, what did Michael say? Whoa, what's over there? Hey, hey. And just kind of jumping around. And sati, again, in the normal way, if you're doing anapanasati, it's a technique for reining it in, for bringing the mind that is otherwise kind of frayed, and maybe afraid, but frayed, and bringing it in. And what I'm suggesting is, is that when we remember something, we are engaging that same kind of mental activity of a kind of focus, because actually while Brendan was talking and while Connie was talking, it also is a kind of thing that if I asked you about what you ate yesterday and you can't really answer it just right off the top of your head, again, bodhisattva, barring bodhisattva, unhindered mental activity, but we have to stop for a second and we have to focus and think about it. And then we can remember, oh yeah, I had miso soup. And what's interesting about it is that if you keep holding the, your mind, a lot of things about yesterday start to open up. And you could kind of start to remember your whole day, but you can only do that by focusing in the sense of remembering. And so Connie, I totally hear what you mean about a, a flood of mental activity that can arise from thinking about what happened yesterday. So I totally get you. I was really just trying to point at the mind, the way the mind works in terms of memory. And, and it's almost an interesting meta, and I don't mean M-E-T-T-A, loving kindness, but I mean like a transcendent activity to try to notice the mind working. Noticing that when you're thinking about yesterday, you're kind of focusing in a way. That's all I was referring to, so. All right, on to the next. So a paragraph like the next paragraph is something that, you know, might just go totally overlooked. And this was the part about how uh, when Srimala returned, excuse me, returned to Ayodhya, she persuaded her husband, this guy, King Mitra Kirti, which I believe is sort of like, um, uh, Mitra is like a friendliness. It's, uh, and then this idea of Kirti is about fame. And so it's like fam famous for being very friendly or something like that, or who the king whose friendliness was renowned, renowned or something like that. But anyways, that's her husband. We haven't heard about him before, but he makes an appearance. And it says that when Srimala returned, she persuaded her husband to establish the Mahayana as the state religion. Um, and that's a gloss of terms. Religion is, doesn't occur in the text, but uh, you could basically understand it as that. And then Srimala teaches the Mahayana to all girls above the age of seven. 
and her husband teaches it to all boys over the age of seven. Again, a paragraph like that might be completely overlooked, but it's something that I find very, very interesting. And I find it interesting because if you go all the way back to probably even session one of this series, it might have been in session two, but I think I got into this even in session one. This sutra is really interesting for describing the way Mahayana Buddhism like worked or operated. And what I mean is, if you remember, the very beginning of the sutra began with Srimala's parents saying, you know, and it says, the sutra says that uh, King Prasanajit or, or whoever it was, I forget the king, I think it was Prasanajit, had just kind of converted to Buddhism, con had seen the light, had, had converted to the Dharma. And the king and the queen think, you know, our daughter, Srimala, she's, a, she's really smart. If she knew about this Dharma, about, the, about Buddhism, she would totally get it. Let's write her a letter explaining the merits of the Tathagata, the benefits of Buddhism. Let's, let's write her a letter. And so they did. And they sent it by messenger. She gets the letter. She reads the letter, has a vision of the Buddha from reading the letter. And that's what sp inspired this entire sutra. That's a really interesting like, description of how this Mahayana was working. And what I mean by that is, is normally, of course, a Pali Sutta, a basic original Buddha Sutra, thus have I heard, once the Buddha was in Shravasti, and the Buddha said to all the monks and nuns, hey, here's the Dharma. This sutra is describing it go Mahayana Buddhism, which is converts converting other con people and kind of getting the, well, turning the Dharma wheel in that sense. And so I think that this sutra is really interesting for speaking about not just the doctrines of Mahayana Buddhism, but the practice of Mahayana Buddhism in that way. And that continues to the, this very paragraph where now Srimala, whose light has been turned on, she goes running back to convert her husband. And then they get in the business of converting all the seven and older ones, which I appreciate that they're not going to indoctrinate the really young, that they're going to kind of wait. At least that's how I read it, that they're going to wait until there's a level of cognition. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> Let's, let's tell you about the Dharma now, right? But anyways, I think I find that little section really revealing about, um, well, about Mahayana Buddhism, either or whenever, my, whenever this sutra was uh, written in that way, whenever Queen Srimala and the kingdom of Ayodhya were around, this is an interesting description of Buddhism and the way it operated at that time. So just to, just to want to point that out. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about that? Pretty straightforward. Interesting, nonetheless. Oh, and by the way, too, um, just to like add a, a little, most scholars are pretty convinced that the Maharatnakuta Sutra collection, the, the collection of 49 sutras, of which Srimala is number 48, most scholars are pretty sure that this collection of sutras represents a type of Buddhism that was very popular in Central Asia. All right, so around Samarkand, Kucha, um, uh, I mean, there's not a lot going on in this region nowadays. I mean, there is, this would be called the, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. It's actually where the Uyghur live. And if you've heard about the plight of the Uyghur against the Chinese, the Uyghur are mainly centered in this area called Xinjiang. 
but back in the day, it went by different names. And most people, scholars, are pretty sure that this collection of sutras comes from that region. And sure enough, in that large region of Central Asia, there were many small kingdoms in which Mahayana Buddhism was the state religion. Like it was an entirely Buddhist uh, community, not, not unlike uh, Lhasa, not unlike Tibet. The way the Dalai Lama, until the Chinese occupied Tibet, the Dalai Lama was both the political and spiritual leader of Tibet. And in many people's opinions, is still the leader and spiritual leader of Tibet in that way. But the idea is, is that that example, the Tibetan empire that was both a major um, world power, at least many, many, many years ago was a major world power, and it was a Buddhist kingdom or a Buddhist nation. Central Asia was full of those, and this little section of the sutra sort of speaks to that. It speaks to these kingdoms that were established upon Mahayana Buddhist teachings. Another little tidbit too, just to, just to share with you, because why not? There's a very famous uh, Chinese Buddhist monk named Xuanzang, and that's uh, Xuanzang. Xuanzang is very famous for his journey to the West, as it's called. He was a Chinese Buddhist monk who went on a 16 year pilgrimage from China by foot all the way through Central Asia, all the way through Afghanistan, Pakistan to India, traveled all around India, and then came back to China with two white elephants stacked with sutras and statues and with his own backpack full of sutras that he got from India. And when he returned from his journey to the West, he wrote a travel journal of all of his adventures as he, when he was away. And he describes these Central Asian Buddhist kingdoms. One of those stories that he relates, and before I tell you this story too, I want you to know, Xuanzang, his, his travel journal is, is, well, first of all, it's regarded as like one of the most important historical documents we have. By the way, oh, this was in the year 630 AD roughly, I forget exactly his years, but basically the middle of the seventh century. It's a very important historical document for what was going on in India, what was going on in Tibet, what was going on in Central Asia in the seventh century. And before I tell you this fun story, I want you to know that Xuanzang's travel journal, so much of it has been verified to be true that for the most part, it seems like the guy was a really honest Buddhist monk and just told it like it was. And so even though a lot of his stories seem a little fantastical, most of the other things that he talks about have been, again, documented to be true. So consider that when you hear about this. He describes one of these Mahayana Central Asian Buddhist kingdoms in which the king of that region was a very you know, beloved ruler. And what would happen is, is that once a year, the king would give everything he owned away until he was basically naked. And then the gifts from the kingdom, would start pouring in. And by the end of the year, the king had amassed the same, the same wealth. And so as a Jubilee, but every year, not every 50 years, he gave it all away again. And he would do this every year. What an interesting model, <laughs> right? 
anyway, so when I read that, I was like, wow, that's an entirely different uh, social structure, right? Okay, so that's, that concludes that portion of the sutra. Next, also very interesting. So the next paragraphs is the one where it says, when the world honored one, return to the Jetta Grove, to Anatha Pindika's park, he called the Venerable Ananda. He also summoned Chakra, king of the gods. So, um, oh, and he, and he summons him just by thinking about him, and then Chakra shows up. And, and then the Buddha says to Chakra, here, take this sutra and teach it to all the gods. Remember this sutra. So what's interesting about that is, if you recall, and I already mentioned it sort of subliminally in a way, all of the early Pali Buddhist sutras, they all begin, of course, thus have I heard. And the I in that thus have I heard is Ananda, the Buddha's young cousin. So you probably all know this, but for the pos posterity here, the idea of course is that Ananda was the Buddha's actual cousin who became a Buddhist, was very young, and Ananda is known for having a very good memory. In fact, he's known for having a kind of, um, not a photographic memory, but a, an audit, I don't know what word that would be, but a perfect recall in terms of what he heard. So not photographic in terms of being able to recall everything he saw, but perfect recall of what he heard. And because he was with the Buddha in all of his different teaching moments, Ananda remembered or recalled all the Buddha's teachings. And that's why every sutra begins, thus have I heard, once the Buddha was staying in such and such a place, because that's Ananda speaking. In other words, all of the early Buddhist sutras, the suttas, were entrusted in that sense to Ananda. It's very interesting that in this Mahayana Buddhist sutra, when the Buddha gets back to Jetta's Grove, he calls Ananda, and he also calls Chakra, the, the king of the gods. And so that's kind of an interesting divergence from the early Buddhist tradition. The Buddha is, yes, the Buddha entrusts this sutra to Ananda, but he also entrusts it to Chakra, king of the gods. And that's that's very different in that way. And that is very much in line with kind of Mahayana Buddhist cosmology that the Dharma is, the Dharma is equally applicable to gods and goddesses. In fact, when the Mahayana Buddhist tradition talks about all sentient beings, they're talking about all sentient beings, from the tiniest little bug, ghosts, hell dwellers, asuras, even the gods can benefit from the Dharma. And so the Buddha entrusts this sutra to chakra. Now, let's see. So the one really important thing about chakra so this god, if you're not familiar with your Buddhist cosmology, or actually, if you're not familiar with Indian cosmology, because this is a very old Indian god, uh, Chakra. The full name is Chakra Devanam Indra, right? The, the, the Lord of the gods, Chakra Lord of the gods, Indra. And this god, Indra, is the god of the 33 levels of heaven. 
And in the basic cosmology of India, of course, there's the giant Mount Maru in the center of the world. And then above, or actually kind of towards the peak of Mount Maru are these 33 heavenly realms of which Chakra, Indra, is the Lord, is the God, and actually is the king of the gods uh, ruling over those 33 realms. But Indra, Chakra Devanam Indra, being that God, he is the God of weather, the God of the sky, the God of meteorological events. And in particular, Indra, Chakra Devanam Indra, is known for having the Vajra weapon. So this sutra mentioned the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. And you are probably familiar with the Vajrayana, Vajrayana Buddhism. This is the Vajra, of course, which is a, a symbol of a lightning bolt. That's what Indra's weapon is, is a, a lightning bolt. Very, very similar. I often like to point this out. Very, very similar to the god Zeus, also king of the gods, gr granddaddy of the gods, also the god of weather who carries a lightning bolt. Similar to Thor in the Norse mythology, also king of the gods who carries a hammer, but it's a thunder or lightning hammer, right? And then if you're familiar with uh, Santaria or the Yoruba tradition of, of West Africa, there is the god Chango, and Chango is also not sure if he's the king of the Orisha, but he's definitely way up there. And he also carries a thunderbolt lightning uh, as, a we as a weapon. So there's something going on with this uh, cross culturally here. And so this, by the way, then is this Vajra. And actually, a Vajra is not exactly lightning. Lightning and thunder are the after effects of Vajra. So Vajra is like this power. And sometimes if you look at, if you go to like a great, um, uh, like an Indian restaurant or an Indian spice shop, and you see the classic uh, multi-armed gods of, of classical Indian uh, religion, uh, wh whether it's uh, Krishna or Vishnu, usually it is Vishnu, but you might see them with their finger like this and they have, well, they have actually what's, what looks like a CD on their finger, but this is um, one early representation of a Vajra. The Buddhists don't use this version, the one that looks like a disc. They use this version, which does look a little bit more like a thunderbolt or a lightning bolt. The traditional story, by the way, is that Chakra, Chakra Devanam Indra, well, traditionally, he's not like the nicest of guys, also kind of like Zeus. You know, Zeus was kind of, kind of a jerk in a way, like, you know, he's a little rough and a little, well, I don't want to get into details. But the idea is Indra was sort of the same way. If you got on Indra's bad side, he'd smote you with his Vajra. But what happens in, in the Buddhist sutras, particularly this happens in the Pranya Paramita sutras, the Chakra, Chakra Devanam Indra, gives the Buddha his Vajra. He like, he like gives up the Vajra. And the Buddha, rather than using the power of the Vajra to smote people, is known for kind of meditating on the power of the Vajra, but not using it. 
And that's why you will often sometimes see in the Tibetan tradition, they will have a bell and the bell will have a Vajra at the top, but it'll go into the bell and they'll have a Vajra like this. And the meditation is often ringing the Vajra bell and meditating on this. This is the thunder, this is the lightning. And the idea is, is that you would meditate on, well, the kind of the phenomena of thunder and lightning in that way, but they all, this tradition goes back to this God Indra or Chakra, Devanam Indra in that way. And so because this sutra mentioned the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom, I think it's interesting that at the end, the Buddha thinks of Chakra and Chakra comes and the Buddha says, hey, here's the sutra, go up and teach it to all the gods. So all of this is kind of very uh, symbolic, of course, in that way. And I'm here to tell you about all the symbolism. So <laughs> questions, comments, answers, ideas about Vajra, Chakra, Indra. Excellent. So I just noticed time at time, it does just move along, doesn't it? So, well, actually we're now just basically to the end. So the last part of this chapter, last part of the sutra is the Buddha telling Ananda and Chakra these different names of the sutra. This is also very, very common in Mahayana Buddhist sutras, that a sutra doesn't just have one name. The Buddha often says, oh, this is this sutra. It's also called this sutra. It's also called the super duper this set sutra. And he kind of, you know, heaps on these uh, different superlatives and like different names of the sutra. So a similar thing is going on here, but what I would like you to know is that these 15 titles of the sutra correspond to the 15 titles of each chapter. Now, my suspicion, suspicion is that this sutra probably originally wasn't divided into chapters. It was probably just one sutra. And at the end of it, the Buddha describes the main points, so to speak. So he would say to Ananda or to, to Chakra, this is the sutra that describes this. This is the sutra that describes that. This is the sutra that describes the Dharmakaya. This is the sutra that describes the Garbhadhatu or the Tathagata Garbha, sorry. And I probably at some point, somebody took those 15 titles of the sutra and then retrospectively divided the sutra into the chapters. It's probably the way this went down. Not 100% sure about that, but we're not 100% sure about much. So, um, so that's how these last... Um, titles of the sutra correspond to the earlier chapters. And if you've been attending all of these sessions, you probably heard or remembered, oh yeah, that was, that was what happened in chapter four. That was what happened in chapter five, right? So really quickly again, just, just real quick. The first one is, the title is called Praising the Virtues of the Tathagata. That's the title of chapter one, but it is also, if you remember, it's also the, it's not the title of Srimala's parents' letter, but it is what Srimala's parents say. They say, we should write a letter to our daughter praising the true merits of the Tathagata. And so the first chapter is called that, but it's also the, the point of her parents' letter. And I actually made a comment off, an offhand comment, maybe that first session, 
where it kind of, it, it alludes to a kind of recursion where maybe her parents' letter is the Sri Mala Sutra, kind of <laughs> like, and the, you know, this gets kind of really like time warpy, but the idea that they sent her her sutra in that way, as it, it, there's just an, an interesting allusion to recursion in the in the earlier part of the sutra, where it talks about praising the merits of the Tathagata. The second title, and anybody please stop me at any time. The second title was the 10 inconceivable vows. And that is indeed what happens in chapter two. Srimala makes these 10, actually not vows, but she makes these 10, uh, uh, she takes or receives these 10 precepts. And I mentioned that those were very similar to the Bodhisattva vows or the Bodhi Bodhisattva precepts which are in addition to regular old Buddhist precepts against killing, stealing, lying, taking sex and taking intoxicants and things like that. The third, it's also called a discourse on the one great vow. And that was the idea that originally Srimala made her 10, uh, took or received her 10 precepts and then made three vows but then they were really all just one vow and that was the the point of chapter three the one great vow very also very similar to the bodhisattva vow to liberate all sentient beings in that way the fourth was embracing the correct dharma i made a huge point about this many nights in a row about this word, uh, parigraha, this idea of being in harmony with the true dharma, embracing the true dharma, accepting the true dharma. That's a big part of what this sutra is about, is about being in line with the true dharma. And, you know, not, I don't want to digress into a whole dharma talk about that. But, you know, there is this kind of, you know, Thing going on with this sutra where you can you can kind of read it as like there's like a superficial dharma and what i mean by a superficial dharma is that you could shave your head all you want you could wear robes all you want you could beg for food all you want you could you could have all of the outward signs of being a Buddhist, the superficial Dharma. But that's nothing if you're not actually in line with the real true Dharma, like the real true teachings in that way. And I think that this sutra, be, especially because of the way that Sri Mala harps on the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, she's kind of saying like, yeah, you guys look like Buddhists, but are you really doing the Dharma? And so she, Srimala, came to talk to us about what it means to embrace or accept the true Dharma, right? This sutra, number five, she's, the, the Buddha says, is also known as entering the single vehicle, entering the ekyayana. So you may want to think that this term, the single vehicle, the ekyayana, that it's basically synonymous with Mahayana. It's like Mahayana Buddhism, you know, the supreme vehicle, the one vehicle. And while that is... Mm, more or less true, the concept of the single vehicle that is described in this sutra, it's kind of a little more than that, because there's a way in which what the single vehicle, the ekyayana is, is this interesting 
way of looking at, and she talks about it, where the, the Hinayana, the little vehicle of the Shravakas, and the vehicle of the solitary enlightened ones, the vehicle of the Pratekya Buddhas, and even the vehicle of the Bodhisattvas, which is the Mahayana. She says they're all one vehicle. They're the Ekyayana. And you might've noticed that the Mahayana was one of those three. So to say that the Ekyayana, the one vehicle, is synonymous with the Mahayana, it's kind of partially true, but it sort of misses the grander point, which is that the true single vehicle may look this way. It may look this way. It might look like a bodhisattva. You could even get into the idea, and I have seen this, by the way, but you wouldn't obviously find it in, in a Buddhist sutra, but in later Buddhism, you start to hear the idea that, oh yeah, even Christianity is part of the single vehicle. Basically like any tradition that's encouraging people to be good and not bad and tell the truth and not that, it's all one vehicle. If it's headed towards liberation, peace and all of these things. So that's, that's a particular read of the Ekiyayana, by the way. So I don't want anybody walking away saying, oh, you know, Christianity is Buddhism in disguise or whatever. Not what I'm saying. I'm just suggesting that the Ekiyayana is a much larger, wilder idea than just Mahayana Buddhism, which is a type of Buddhism. What's really interesting, actually, and I didn't mention this the night, whatever night that we discussed chapter five, the single vehicle, I didn't mention something. And it's interesting because it just dawned on me um, that I've already, I did it again. I did this little subliminal thing and I didn't even mean to. <laughs> that sutra, sutta, the Pali sutta that I mentioned, the Satipatthana, the foundations of mindfulness sutra, you know what's interesting about that sutra? It be, before the Buddha tells the bhikshus, before the Buddha tells the monks what the four foundations of mindfulness are, he says to them, monks, this, what I'm about to tell you, is the ekyayana, the single vehicle. He actually, in that old, very old Pali Sutta, uses the expression single vehicle, the ekyayana, to describe sati, the practice of mindful awareness. This is a Mahayana Sutra that's about the single vehicle, and I already gave my diatribe about how this is kind of a modern, modern, a Mahayana version of the foundations of mindfulness where we are not meditating necessarily on our body or this physical body, but we're meditating on the Dharmakaya in that sense. So interesting, right? That that expression Ekyayana is very old. It's in some of the early Pali suttas. Chapter six, very quickly, was called um, a discourse on the well, th the way that I read it here in the, the version I'm reading here says a discourse on the boundless truth. But if we remember that chapter was really about a it was a discourse on the the immeasurable or infinite four noble truths. And that was where Sri Mala gave her new version of the Four Noble Truths, where she said, yeah, there's the, there's the Four Noble Truths you've heard, but there's like a secret Four Noble Truths. So there's really like eight Noble Truths. There's four conditioned and four unconditioned in that way. Um, and so chapter six was about the infinite Noble Truths in that sense. Chapter seven, the Tathagata Garbha. 
that was a big chapter. That was the idea of this idea of the womb of Buddhahood. And that's where we talked about this idea. And, and this is, that was the chapter where this lion's roar of Queen Srimala really started to get going, where she was sort of done talking about the, like, or she was done taking precepts, taking vows, talking about the Four Noble Truths, like talking about stuff we've heard before. It was in the Tathagata Garbha chapter that Sri Mala really started to introduce new ideas on us, ideas that we definitely do not see in those early Pali suttas. And one of those ideas is this, the womb of Buddhahood, the womb of Tathagatas. That's definitely an idea that you will not find in the early suttas, but it is a defining characteristic of the Mahayana. And, you know, I encouraged, um, I encouraged us to take the, the womb metaphor kind of seriously in that way, but to consider it as like this, like insofar as I identify with my physical body, so insofar as I identify with this fleshy body, then I, I look back to my mother's womb because it is from whence this came. So the original produ production source of this physical body was my mother's womb. But if I'm not really identifying or in particular being attached to my physical body that was out of my mother's womb. And if I were trying to identify with the Dharmakaya, well, where does the Dharmakaya come from? Where does the Dharma body arise from? The Tathagata Garbha, the womb of thusness, the womb of thus come ones. And that's where we started getting into this much more wild discourse, which was about a kind of radical, radical re-understanding of samsara, a radical re-understanding of this realm of birth, death, and rebirth, the radical realm of suffering that we find ourselves in, unlike, unlike the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas, that regard this realm, that regard samsara, that regard this as suffering and the realm of Mara. In other words, this place is hell, according to the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas. In the Mahayana, this is the womb. This is the womb of thus come ones. This is where the, all Buddhas come from this realm. And in, and in fact, if we remember, there was the key line from that chapter that it was it's because we are born in this realm of suffering that we desire to get out of it and that's begins that rebirth rebirth into our dharmakaya and actually correction into the dharmakaya there is only one dharmakaya undifferentiated non-dual so a, mo a second ago, when I said into our Dharmakaya, I misspoke. <laughs> there is only one in that sense. Okay, I've been moving pretty quick. So everybody with me? Or <laughs> chapter nine, the hidden reality of the teaching of emptiness. And that's where Srimala really demonstrated exactly how smart she really was or is. And kind of then, oh, I'm actually, I'm sorry, not that. Tathagata Garbha, the next chapter is the Dharmakaya, of course. I, sp I spoke so much about the Dharmakaya, I thought I already did this chapter. So makes perfect sense that after the womb of Buddhahood chapter, we get the chapter on what is the Dharmakaya, the undifferentiated non-dual body. 
So insofar as you don't think you're me or you don't think you're Buddha or you don't think you're the very laptop that you're looking at this on, that's duality. And if you collapse everything into a non-dual state, that's the Dharmakaya. Em embody that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> then we get, apologies again for that. Then we get chapter nine, which is about the true or the hidden reality of the teaching of emptiness. And that's where Srimala really schooled us on the real meaning of emptiness as it pertains to the Dharmakaya and the arising of that Dharmakaya, because it comes out of this understanding of emptiness, which she said is the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. So the understanding of emptiness is the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. The next chapter, chapter 10, whoop, chapter 10, a discourse on the single Dharma, the one truth. After everything I just said, that shouldn't be surprising. We're working on the oneness, the unity, the, the non-duality. So... There can't be two dharmas. There can't be multiple. It's one, all one truth in that sense, in that sense. Then the discourse on the one ever abiding immovable quiet refuge. And that's where she started to collapse what would otherwise be the traditional act of taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. She does this interesting thing where she kind of says, well, the Sangha is the Buddha and the Buddha is the Dharma and the Dharma is the Sangha and Sangha is the, so it's really just one refuge. And it's refuge in the true correct Dharma in that way. And uh, then the interesting chapter on inversion and reality. If you know your Heart Sutra, they were talking about upside down dreamlike thinking versus in awakening, enlightenment, in that sense, right? Delusion, enlightenment. Chapter 13 was about that intrinsically pure mind wrapped in defilements. She had this beautiful Srimala, she had this beautiful image that we're like, we are like in shells of ignorance. And the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom can crack open those shells of ignorance. And the idea is to use a very, very classic Buddhist metaphor. It's like a pearl dipped in mud. Our intrinsically pure mind is like the pearl that's just covered in these defilements, but it's otherwise intrinsically pure. And so all we got to do is kind of clear away the defilements. But what what is underneath is not defiled in that sense. That led us to the penultimate chapter, which is about being a true child of the Tathagata. And with all this talk about wombs, being born into our Dharmakaya, it shouldn't be a mystery what it means to be a child of the Buddha in that sense. And then the last chapter was called the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. Actually, the true lion's roar of Queen Srimala. And once again, just to clarify, what is the lion's roar? According to this sutra, they defined it as the declaration that one has ended rebirth. To say, I'm done. This is my last rebirth. And not just to say it hopefully, but to say it knowingly, to know this is one's last rebirth, that is making the true lion's roar, according to the sutra. And that was it. And then everybody danced with joy, right? Rejoiced and, uh, oh, they were jubilant. They accepted the sutra with faith and began to practice it with veneration. Ta-da! <laughs> All right, friends.
Thank you so much for sticking with all of that, that wonderful quick review at the end of the teachings. Um, that's going to conclude our study of this sutra. I'm not quite sure what we have in store next week, but it'll be a sutra, and it'll be me, and it'll be Dharma Doors. So stay tuned for that.